you know, there's a lot of times where we find ourselves in a position where we don't know exactly what's going on. I mean, you can listen to the news, but, you know, there's so little that's actually being said that is um, positive. But there's a lot of positive things happening there, uh, happening in the world right now, that you really have to dig to find out what's happening. But there's some pretty tremendous things that are happening, um, not only in the United States, but abroad. Um, there's strong evidence that a lot of the prophecies, a lot of the decrees, uh, much of, of of the prophetic utterances that have been sent out through prophecies have begun to work, and they're pay, paying a toll on those who have declared to be our enemies. And also, there's things that are beginning to tighten up in the area of those things that are concerning a lot of people right now is the health of our nation. Uh, you know, a lot of questions coming up about that. I had a question come up uh, from one of our ministers just this week about how is the stock market up at 35000 You know, that's over, higher than it's ever been, when the economy seems to be such an inflated uh, factor with money being printed like crazy. How is that happening? Well, I can just simply say that, uh, you know, all the trillions of dollars that have been approved through all these different bills that have been passed, uh, they bought into the market. They basically just bought the stock and increased the value of the stock by the purchases of it. So if the stock market has somebody come dump a trillion dollars into it, it's going to go up. And uh, that's essentially what's happening. Who owns that stock? Not we the people, the corporation of the government. So we're going to see some real strange happenings take place uh, through these events of how this is all going to get fixed. But as we are going forward, we're not trying to be in a place to where we're um, being aggressive in any way, being violent in any way, uh, being uh, irresponsible of our duties as people of the United States, but we also are not wanting to be uh, ostriches sticking our head in the sand either. We want to be upfront and honest on those things that we know to be true. And that's always the case, not just in part of it. Today is a little bit different in the Mandate 34, the Apostolic Mandate. The Lord rebukes you. <laughs> That's an odd title. But this is the 31st Halloween, the 31st of October, which is the mark of Halloween, as people refer, refer to it. But, you know, uh, some people refer to it, harvest festivals and all kinds of things. But, you know, we're sitting in a different position. We're also even taking a little bit of a different turn here this Sunday, uh, specifically just to give you some credential and also to give you not just fake hope, but give you some understanding. Things are about to really start happening in a way that will be obvious to you, especially you who uh, carry the, the clasp of the hand of the king and wear your prophetic mantle and are part of the special remnant of God. There's a lot of things that are going to begin to lock in, and you're going to see things happen just right, just shortly right after you get through releasing the words that God gives you. So with that said, let's go to the first page of the mandate today, and let's get started in talking about what God's doing now. No trick or treat here. That's the main title, subtitle of today's message. Driving through our small community, I, had, I was humored by a number of the church groups opening up their car trunks, giving out candy for trick or treat. Some are opening their doors for those interested in celebrating the harvest of local crops in a Wicca sort of way, if you know what I mean. As I drove around, God downloaded a thought into my soul as if he were asking me, is Christianity a spiritual kingdom or a religious extension of the world's ways? Well, needless to say, it made me examine who we, the special remnant God, really are. Where do we fit in that question? Suddenly, the past dozen or more apostolic mandates raced through my thoughts, bracing myself from the whirlwind of data being processed within me. Our Lord began showing me what is coming, not in the sense of a natural or political event, but more about Him releasing more of His power through knowledge. I now know something big is about to be prophetically imparted into us, being the special remnant of God that will truly separate us even more from the religious sect of this digital age. 
And I think you know what I'm talking about. God's getting ready to release a prophecy. And when he does, he releases the power with it. But you have to have a lot of knowledge to go with that power if you don't know what to do with it. It is written, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, speak these things, exhort and rebuke all with authority. No one despise you. Let no one despise you. Titus 2, 11 through 55. Now that is a whole lot of information right there just in that first page. But I just wanted you to know that what he's talking about in some of these areas that just kind of get it just in a paraphrased version without just the text, reading the text, is that he's preparing to release an impartation of a new level of power through knowledge and through that knowledge used properly in the way the Lord says that it will demonstrate even more of what he's about to bring forth to manifest and before all these other things begin to take take fold. Now, I know a lot of people just really have a hard time seeing that there's any possibility of winning. But let, let me remind you, every time God has come into your life and began to meet you at your need, didn't he always do it at the last minute? I mean, he didn't do it any time ahead of time. He never was too late, even though you could question it. But he used every bit of the grace period that was remaining in that issue that you were challenged with until you got to right to the very edge, and then he saved you. Then he made something happen to make it all clear. In fact, that reminds me of what happened this last week. Um, uh, Eric and Savannah have been moving, and they moved into an apartment in uh, North Richmond Hills. And, uh, well, you know, that's not an easy thing to do when you're working and, you know, trying to move out of, out of one place and also move stuff out of storage and get it all up on the second floor of an apartment. Well, it was late at night, and they were just tired. They haven't been able to uh, have their meals regularly, hadn't been sleeping much, had been a lot, losing a lot of sleep, actually, about an hour and a half sleep total for a 24-hour period. And they were just exhausted. And, of course, I didn't know I wasn't there. I was just about ready to doze off to sleep when I got a phone call. And it was Savannah, and she was just crying and crying. And, you know, when you're your baby girl's crying, you know, you just you automatically start thinking, oh, what's happened now? What's going on? But she was crying of joy. And I thought, what could this be? While she's trying to help Eric put this heavy piece of equipment up the flight of stairs into their apartment, she felt that she just couldn't do it. It was frustrating. They were frustrated at each other. It was 1030 at night. They were tired, hungry, and needed to get it in because the weather was turning and they didn't want to leave that piece of furniture outside. So all of a sudden, she says, this guy comes walking around, big old guy, had long, um, I believe she said white, wavy hair, and wore glasses. And he said, hi, I'm Jeremy. Can I help you? And she, of course, she surely accepted the help. And she said the guy literally picked the thing up and carried it up the stairs. They had it on dollies and trying to move it that way, couldn't move it all. And they couldn't even budget, just slide it up the steps. He just picked it up and carried it up there and put it in there, and then they turn around, and he's gone. Now, she knew exactly what happened because, I mean, around our place, we're always having some kind of encounter with an angel, and that's exactly what happened. An angel came by at their hour of need and helped them, even though they probably weren't even asking. They were probably just at their wit's end, didn't know what to do, and God intervened. Now, that made me happy. I had to go wake up Debbie. <laughs> Wait, look, you got to wake up. Listen, listen to this. And I told her, well, we both cried together and happy and joy and all, joyous and all that. But I'm just telling you, people, this stuff that we do is real. We're not worldly. In fact, I had somebody write me this week said, is your school accredited? Meaning, is it connected to any university or Bible college that she could get credit for it if, if she went through the courses that we're going through? And I said, uh, ma'am, we don't qualify um, enough of the world to be accredited we're, you know we're not that worldly so we're, no we're not accredited we don't plan on being accredited because that's not which way we're going 
we're standing alone with one. We only have one to, to approve of what we do and one to please what we do, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm just talking about a lot of different things here to help you get through this week because starting the next couple of weeks, you're going to start seeing a lot begin to happen. I know that there are not any really telltale signs out there, but when the Spirit of the Lord starts rising up in me and lets me know these things are about to happen, I'm just on edge waiting for the information. Give me the knowledge, and I'll share it with the people in the best ability I can. So as we go through this process, I want you to understand what we're talking about today is these are things that are real. These are things that are true. These are testimonies that you should expect to work in your life, should expect to work in your life. Now, like last week, we went through the declaration and, and decrees. As you remember that, you know, if you don't remember, go back and read them. But it is very important that you understand that what God is saying is he's going to send us the angelic help. But if he doesn't, what do you do? That's that's something you need to really count through and consider. And that's something we'll cover also in page two, which I'm going to right now. So let's look and see what we've got on page two. God's power works. Um, I'm going to set this up a little bit because before I start talking about this, this this event took place, oh, this has been about three years ago, and there was a, a lady in Hawaii uh, back in the 90s who helped set up a lot of the churches I was going in to minister at. She just got to go out before me, and when I got there, they had a whole itinerary set up for me. Well, years went by, and she... she uh, uh, I don't know whether her husband passed away or what, but she remarried. And she married a guy that was uh, a well-known apostle amongst the people in Hollywood. And uh, they had grown their ministry considerably. Uh, they had a home in Minnesota. They had a home in Hawaii and had a home in, in Los Angeles, California. So, you know, they they were doing well on that respect, but they were coming to see us about this. A couple of years ago, a few people came to our home who had an international ministry and wanted to discuss joining our ministry, or joining our ministries together. And during the day, many conversations were more or less pleasantries only. Nothing really gotten down to, to brass tacks, so to speak. But then the apostle of the group wanted to demonstrate his supernatural abilities to show us what he could do. I thought that was unusual that somebody would do that, but of course we were all attending. He asked for a photo of myself. Then he asked me to turn my chair facing him. As he held my picture to his chest, he asked if I could see his face change to look like Jesus. Well, you know, I I just, you know, I gave it the benefit of the doubt, whatever he's talking about. I don't know what this, is gonna, what this leads to. But, you know, to be honest with him, when he asked me the question, I said, no, but I can see my appointed angel standing right behind you. Then my angel started telling me about his childhood and a few other things. The apostle was a wreck, scared and perspiring with fear. He put the picture down very slowly like. Then he began to repeat over and over saying, Prophet Simpson is the real thing. He was scared. He was, he was really broken in so many ways. And like I've said in my notes today, I'll have to tell you the rest of the story on the the podcast and video, so that's where we're at right now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more in detail how this transpired. What happened was that, you know, the Lord exposed him enough through telling of his life, and he knew it was true, the things that was said prophetically about his life in a word of knowledge. And as that was revealed to him, it scared him because he knew now I'm dealing with the real deal. Before he was working in some type of uh, either magic or illusionist or some kind of trickery that he was conning people into giving him large sums of money. So, and the reason why I know that is because after we had this little event, he wanted to show me, he kept, he kept really uh, pressing me to look up him on the internet, look him up on the internet. And I said, well, I'll, I will, but I thought I would do it, you know, in my spare time, not while we were trying to visit. But he took it upon himself to pull up the Internet himself and show me. 
And in a roundabout way, what he was doing was making a confession of what he'd done because there was all these reports that were posted on the Internet, these people talking about how this man, the same guy that I was talking to, had come to them and had fleeced out of them hundreds of thousands of dollars and left them destitute. Now, that wasn't just one person. There was a few. And, in fact, you know, I guess they had run out of people, so he was going to think about joining us and use our people. But, you know, God's not going to let that happen. And I thought it was really interesting how I didn't have to do a thing. I didn't have to to scout this guy out. I didn't have to to digging for questions to trying to find out about him. I didn't have to do any of that. God made it all fall right into place, even allowing him to do something that backfired on him, uh, his so-called supernatural powers. And as those things began to unfold, he saw the real, and the real scared him because he realized now I'm standing in a place where I can't, I can't really deal with this individual. I can't really con this man because he's truly a man of God. And, and I think it really put him in a place to where he knew he was done. In fact, they left. He went back to L.A., and his wife went back to the home in Minnesota, and they slowly began to fade, fade away, because he could not do what he used to do. It's kind of like the, the scripture where uh, Elimaeus, uh, you know, was, came to Paul and wanted to take some power from Paul and Barnabas and you know, he, they, they rebuked him and sent him away blind. And he was blind for a season. Or even Acts 16, 16, where, you know, uh, Apostle Paul and Silas were going about preaching. And this woman who was a fortune teller would go behind them all day saying, these are the men that can lead you into, lead you into salvation. Well, that wasn't a bad thing to be said, but it became a nuisance. And Apostle Paul knew after a while, that, hey, this is just a way to be able to disrupt what the Holy Spirit's wanting to do. So he just simply turned and rebuked her and stripped her of her abilities to do any more fortune telling, which led uh, Paul and Silas into a bad situation because she couldn't do any fortune telling for her, her masters anymore who, had, who were, she was making money for by telling them what to invest in and what to buy and what to do. Uh, through fortune telling, and she lost that ability. It was stripped from her, and her masters went and arrested, had them arrested. Uh, Paul and Silas arrested and put in the stockades, and, you know, you can read the rest of the Bible. It's Acts 16. Just read it for yourself. But there's a lot of things that God is beginning to do in many lives, not just in a few special people. I know people have felt like, well, that was Paul, and that was Silas, that was Barnabas, that was John, that was James. You know, and that was Jesus. But listen, Jesus said, greater works you shall do than I. John 14, 12. For I go to be with the Father. Greater works you shall do than I. So what, what, what are we supposed to expect? To do greater works than he says we could do. We can do them if he says we can, if you believe. And there's one thing that you have to understand. The knowledge is so important. You have to know how this is going to happen. What you're to do in order for it to manifest. How are you supposed to activate it? All these things are important, and that's what God's had me be doing when I'm doing prophetic words anymore. They're not like they used to be years ago, 30 years ago when I started prophesying. You know, it was it was like a, a machine gun, just bah, 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 you know, talking and not not really having any continuity to it. But there was things being said in the midst of it that really made you know that, yeah, He's hearing God. But now it's so much more purified, so much more. Uh, analytical. It's getting to the place to where, like Russ Walden said to me one day having lunch, he said, you know, you're like a tacticianer. God said you're his tacticianer. You know how to tactically work these things and these power gifts. And that's that's exactly what, what, I, what God has me doing. But I had to go through a, a number of years of, of having it, I guess you might say, perfected in my own ministry so that I would be able to understand it more to tell you. Now that's what we're doing. I'm releasing these prophetic words for the purpose of equipping you for the work that God has for you to do. And a big part of that is the angelic host of God. I think everybody pretty much recognizes that now. But now we're going to get into a situation where we're going to see even greater power given to those special remnant folks who 
wearing the sacred cloth, wearing the, the clasp of the hand of the king, and even something else God's about to release. I've got an idea what it is that he's about to release, but I'm still, I'm still waiting on some confirmation on it before I put it in print and put it out there in email for everybody to know it's available. So get ready, get ready, because this will begin to change a lot of the dynamics of what happens around you. I don't know how many of you have followed through with the prophecies, the prophetic words that have gone out uh, recent as of September, but August through September, but that particular word dealt with calling down fire, releasing uh, floods, rele doing all kinds of things supernaturally, but in the natural way. And that was for this reason, to gain the attention, also set, set a precedence of the fact that there's power in the righteous. There's power in the prophetic. There's power in those that are going to walk according to the, the voice of God. Now, I know a lot of people want to hear God, but they just want to hear God tell them things they want to hear. It doesn't work that way. you got to do it God's way, and that's the only way it will work. And that's kind of hard sometimes because it doesn't make, you know, when he says what he wants you to do, you're thinking, how's that going to work? You know, if you ever received a prophetic word through this ministry from me, you know what I'm talking about. Some of those prophetic words are 20 minutes long. It depends on the individual and how much information the Holy Spirit is giving me to you because it depends upon how much knowledge you already have. When you have the least amount of knowledge, you're going to have to have the, the more of the prophetic word. But... If, you don't, if you've got a lot of knowledge that you obtain and you're using that knowledge, then he doesn't have to give you as much, but he can give you enough to where you'll find that that power will work very quickly. So that's where we're at. So let's look at what the rest of what this particular page has for us this week, and we'll find out more. This is, this is also dealing with um, the, the, the things of God, but also this is the decree. I think you'll find this decree very interesting. And... Uh, I, I like always I use my name in it. I just say Prophet Simpson because everybody's always wanting to know what they call me. And so I finally had to come to the conclusion that I need to make that clear. I, Prophet Simpson, declare and decree. If I am faced with danger, I will ask if the person can see my angel. Now, I think you know why. I will not defend myself unless that person does not see my angel. Prior to defending myself, I will say with no fear in my voice, the Lord rebukes you. If the challenger continues to harm me, I will protect myself. Now, what, what, why do we even need to be talking about this? Well, there's one part in here I didn't even put in here, and I need to say it. Is it not only will I rebuke that person, but I'll also go into a matter of tongues that will scare every demon that person has within them to hightail it. Because I will protect myself, and if that person does not, react to the rebuke, re react, does not see the angel, and, and I cannot defend myself through tongues, then I will take other means to protect myself, and I think you know what that would be, because I'm not going to be foolish. God has given us all kinds of ways to de defend, but the fact is, I want to make it in such a manner in which there's a priority to this, but there's also a sense of protocol, and I believe you would do wise the same thing that you must find yourself in a position of deciding how you will deal with whatever comes your way and how you'll go about it and stick with it. Because at the moment and the hour in which you stand before somebody who's ready to harm your family, you can't make that rational decision. You need to make that decision now. This right here will help you. This decree and declaration will help you be able to be put in that position. I would add in this because I ran out of room in the typing of this particular page is that you will speak in tongues. I mean, I've had, I've had it happen before where I've been in a foreign country, been faced with people that, you know, I didn't know their language, and they probably didn't understand me. But the fact of the matter is I was, I was about to come into some real hurt, <laughs> some real pain. But I just laid into them, speaking in tongues with great authority. I was rebuking them by the Spirit, through the Spirit, in tongues. Now, I don't know if some of those words they uh, recognized in their own language or not. At the point in time, it was not to be measured. I just wanted to get free of this particular situation. And they turned and not walked away. They ran away. I don't even know what was said. 
I didn't even think to ask the Lord at the time, Lord, what did you just speak through me? Or what just came out of me that spoke to them? What, you know, but I didn't know. And I didn't ask. I was just so relieved to not have to be in a confrontation in a foreign land. Because you know how those things go. They don't work out too good. But as you find yourself today in the USA, we have the foreign lands coming to us. And they're coming by the multitudes. And they are going to find, when they get here, that a lot of the promises that have been made to them will not be kept. And they're going to be very angry. And they're going to look for a way to be able to get what they need. You know right now that our shores are backed up with the ocean full of barges loaded down with shipping containers full of product that can't get into port. We know that this is causing a dilemma. But you need, need not fear. You should be in a position where you recognize God will take care of me, but also you need to be as prepared as you can in the natural, but trust in the Spirit. And as you are doing that, know also that there will be people who don't look at either one of those things. They're just hungry and want to find food. So when they can't find food, even when they maybe got their own house, maybe they even have a job, but they can't find any food, you got to be prepared. If that person wants to come and hijack, or what do they call it, home invasion, to get some food, you need to be ready. And I'm telling you now, be ready in spirit and in mind and in the natural physically because you need to be ready to take care of your family. So first thing, we're going to ask them if they can see our angel. That's going to set them off guard a little bit. Then the next thing you're going to do is begin to speak in tongues and rebuke them. Rebuke them in the natural, in your natural tongue, and in the spiritual tongue. And then, if it still comes at you, which I doubt it will, you better have something as a backup. And I'm not going to tell you what to use because you need to decide that for yourself. Now, we got some more stuff to go through today. I hope you're getting a lot out of it today because this is information that can help you now, can help you in a very dire situation. I'm not just telling you some promise of the Bible. I'm telling you what God's telling you for now, right now. This is scripture for you now that you need to put to heart. All right, let's get on to this. All right, once you have gone through that, let's say what is written. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring accusation or reviling accusation, but said to the Lord, said, the Lord rebuke you. Who was he talking to? He was talking to Satan. He did not dare him, nor did he bring against him any reviling accusation. He didn't get all up in his face. He just said simply, the Lord rebukes you. Now, that's Michael the archangel. You know what he could have done, but that's what he did. You need to take that to consideration. Also, it says in 1 Chronicles 16, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sake, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. There's three places in the Bible that phrase is used right there. Do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. Three places in the Bible. I think that's significant. Now, let's go on to the third page because this is a story I think you'll find very interesting. This is just another one of those um, affirmatives and also testimonies that will give you some insight into how God actually will defend you in one of the ways. We ain't scared. I recall a testimony about a family in Louisiana who moved to a small town that was known for not taking too kind to spirit-filled preachers. The family purchased a small piece of land with their own money and had started laying out the forms for a foundation. They were going to build a church there. The family was warned by the townspeople that Pentecostals are not welcomed in their community. As the family was setting up the piers for the floor joists, they noticed a few men walking up toward them. The family, the family was worried. They were very worried because the men had bats and axe handles. The leader of the group began to question the preacher and threatens him to leave town. To show the preacher he meant what his threat to be taken serious, he took up an axe handle and touched the preacher on the forehead telling him next time he will split him open if he did not leave. Well, the preacher assured his family that 
God would not have sent them to start his church there and not keep them safe. Before the church was completed, the fear began to strike the hearts of the townspeople. The leader was gathering a few men to head back to the preacher's church to destroy the building and split open the preacher's head. So, on the way, the preacher, the leader, on the way, the leader lost control of his car, hitting a tree. A branch on the tree was just jutting out, and it split the leader's head wide open in the very spot where he tapped the preacher's forehead. Now, I think you understand what happened. Touch not my anointing and do my prophets no harm. That man, that leader of that gang, did, made a big mistake touching that preacher, just barely touching him in the forehead with that axe handle cost him his life. It is written, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter the narrow gates, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who are going in by it. Matthew 7 and 12. So, I think you find that is hopefully helpful because this is a true story about the testimony of the man. In fact, he, he wound up building the church. The church grew for the fact that that one leader was taken out of the picture. He caused havoc all over town about a lot of things, not just about spirit-filled preachers. So when he was removed, the town began to grow, the church grew, and he stayed there for many years. Now, I, I know this to be true because I've had experiences myself where people tried to interrupt what God had me doing. And it was amazing some of the things happened. I don't have time to go through all those stories because really it would sound braggadocious if I did, and I'm not trying to do that. I want to give honor to God in all things, especially to inquire of these things for you today. I'm doing this so that you will be hopefully uh, prepared and full of belief and faith that you can depend upon God. Because if you can't depend on God, who can you depend upon? No one. He is true to his word. He will send the angel to help you. He will take all concerns and put those things as precedent when he sends, uh, sees them to be a threat. Now, you might think that you need a new car or something like that. Well, a lot of times God just lets you just deal with what you got. You hadn't really got to that place. But I hear people crying, crying out to God, I need a miracle. I want to see a miracle. And I thought, why, why do you need to see a miracle? I just need to see a miracle. <laughs> what, what about? Well, just anything, just so that I can feel God's presence. That's it. Well, I'll tell you how he does that. He's going to put you in between a rock and a hard spot so that you'll need a miracle, and then maybe he'll give you a miracle. No, I wouldn't be going asking for that because you have to be put in a place where you really need it. And, you know, if, if, that's not an easy place to be. That you got in that place because of being foolish or being Ill, um, not very responsible or even the fact you got in that place because you had a lack of knowledge. For my people perish, he says, for lack of knowledge. So as we get ourselves more knowledgeable about the things of God, we're more accountable to the things of God. But where you're more accountable, you're also assured to have more of his power. Through his knowledge, there is power. Through his ways, there's always actions that are positive. Through his thoughts, you know exactly what to do. We are acquiring the thoughts and ways of God. For what reason? To be prepared to help others get through the process of all that we're going through in this day and time. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about a lot of different things that have happened, a lot of different preachers I know, stories of other preachers of what happened, but I want you to get ready to have your story, for you will have a time where you can share with your family, with your friends, and even with even total strangers about what God has done in your life, and he did it through sending an angel to minister on your behalf. Sometimes that part of ministry is not about healing or deliverance, but sometimes it's about just taking care of business, like having a branch in a tree work as God's axe handle on behalf of you to take care of you. God does not coddle our enemies. He is a God of war. He will defend his own, and he will defend you. Just don't give up. Don't ever give up. 
Don't ever think that he will not be there for you, for he will. So be it. One more time. I want you to be praying for my wife's mama today, Nelda. She lives in San Antonio, Texas, with Debbie's brother, my Debbie, Debbie Simpson. And she was rushed to the hospital just a while ago, just before we got started. And uh, she's somewhere ruptured and and uh, losing blood, and she's she's needing help. She needs prayer. So I ask you for your prayers for her today. Her name's Nelda. And I thank you, and I'm believing right along with you that this is going to turn out to be nothing. So be it. God bless you all. To all, a good day.